Hello lovelies, it's me, Ashlyn, and I've been wanting to deep dive into this garden for like a year now. So come along for a tour of one of the best medicinal gardens in the world. I'm at the Royal College of Physicians in London. The Royal College of Physicians has an incredible collection of medicinal plants from all corners of the earth and it covers ancient medicinal herbs all the way to plants still being researched to this day. The fact that people can come and see the progression of plant medicine and the cultural ties to those plants is such a gift to the public. They have beautifully illustrated booklets and this expansive online database, so you can get a crash course in botany and pharmacology without having to even set foot in a classroom. The Royal College of Physicians is the oldest medical college in all of England. So this place has been around, I think, since the 1500s. Yep, 1518 to be exact. Can you imagine being witness to the past 500 years of medicine? All the horrific mistakes, the death, but also human brilliance. But let's get straight to the plants because they have over a thousand species in this little slice of London. First up, the Pharmacopoeia Londonensis Garden Beds. In the 1600s, about 100 years after their founding, the Royal College of Physicians published a sanctioned list of drugs, essentially herbs that were categorized according to the part of the plant used. This book was the law, and if you were a doctor or apothecary distributing something not listed in this text, then you could get in big trouble. The Pharmacopoeia Londonensis Beds give us a taste of what plants are in this book and how they were used. So this is a really interesting format here, these gardens, because they're broken up into flowers, seeds, roots, uh, grains, and just basically every um, characteristic. This first bed is all medicinal flowers. The first thing you notice are the roses, and these aren't just any roses. These are Gallica and Damask roses, which are some of the earliest cultivated species. We're talking long before the RCP even existed. Ancient civilizations have used these roses for thousands of years for medicine and skin care. Then we have poppies, the plant family responsible for opiates like codeine, morphine, heroin, and oxycodone. These dainty plants have a long history of human use and abuse. I grow a lot of poppies in my garden, including an opium poppy called Hungarian Blue. Sorry, just wanted to show off my poppies real quick. Peonies. Many parts of the peony plant were used medicinally, not just the flowers. We don't use peonies in Western medicine anymore, I don't believe, but the peony was so important to ancient Greece that it's named after Peona, the doctor to the gods themselves. Peonies also grow in East Asia, where they are still very much a part of traditional Chinese medicine. In this flower bed, you can also find Melolotus officinalis, or sweet clover, which was used to make the blood thinner warfarin, and also lily of the valley, betony, lavender, and calendula. I love calendula for salad garnishes and skin cream. I grow a ton of it every year. The second Pharmacopoeia Londonensis bed contains all kinds of medicinal roots. So let's take a look at this. More peonies and others you might know, like horseradish root and licorice root. But true to form, I make a beeline once I spot the angelicas. Angelicas are my personal obsession. I have five species and counting. Medicinally, they aren't used so much anymore, at least in Western medicine. But I have a couple of species from Asia that are still important in traditional Eastern medicine. Iris root. It's fallen out of favor as a medicine, but as a perfume, it can be worth more than gold. Certain bearded irises, like this one, famous in Florence, Italy, continue to be grown for their fragrant resin extracted from their rhizomes. It's called orris butter, and it's exported all over the world and used in cosmetics and perfumery. Philippindula vulgaris, a very important drug, has come from this plant. These are my meadow sweets, very closely related to Philippindula vulgaris. These plants contain a bitter chemical called salicin, and salicin is synthesized into acetylsalicylic acid, aka aspirin. Nowadays, aspirin is made synthetically, but for thousands of years, uh, people have used these plants for pain and inflammation. False hellebores. 
Okay, this one has a lot to it and you'll just have to deep dive on it later, but it looks like there are several species of false hellebore and they all have potent chemicals. One compound in particular is cyclopamine and it can affect stem cell division. This effect was first noticed in sheep that had been eating false hellebores and their offspring had fetal deformities, in particular having only one eye, hence cyclopamine. Researchers have extrapolated this biochemistry into cancer drugs some of which are still on the market today. There are quite a lot of root medicinals to explore here, but let's move on to the next category. Fruits and shoots. Let's start with the most obvious. This is Malus domestica, or the common apple. And you can imagine back in the day, they would have fermented the apples to keep them for a long period of time. And because sometimes it was safer to drink cider than it was to drink the water. An apple a day does keep the doctor away, and boozy apples are even better. Other revered fruits archived here are pomegranate and currants. And oddly enough, this plant, the mandrake, most people know it for its human-like roots and association with Harry Potter, of course. I love the plaque which reads, Ancient belief states root shrieks when harvested, striking dead the harvester. Mandrake is a toxic plant, causing sedation, hallucinations, increased heart rate, coma, and even death. But like many plants, mandrake was used by folk healers and physicians before the development of modern medicine. The next two beds contain plants with medicinal leaves. Because there's a crossover between medicine and food, you should recognize quite a few of these, like mint, oregano, bay leaves, sage, thyme, whorehound, and if you're a forager, you'll also recognize violets and plantain and know why they're classified as medicinal plants. I'm not an expert herbalist by any means, but I do use these plants in very old school ways. I make herbal vinegars with violet leaves and candy the flowers. With plantain, I make face creams to clear up the skin, and I've even used it to treat my eye infections. There's just something very satisfying about using plants for your own health and and feeling that connection with people long ago who also relied on these same plants. Anyways, check out my TikTok if you wanna keep going down that rabbit hole. But we shall move on to goat's rue. Because of this plant, we have metformin, the most widely prescribed drug for type two diabetes. There's also waldgermander, historically used for gout, now found to be toxic to the liver. And then we have comfrey. Herbalists still use comfrey leaves today, often making a salve to apply externally to the skin. Now, the safety and efficacy of this treatment is wishy-washy, but I know people who use it that way, and even more, who make a compost tea from the leaves to fertilize their garden. The last two Pharmacopoeia londonensis beds contain all the little bits like seeds, bark, and gums, and resins. Two plants really interest me in this category. One is called rock rose. There are several species of rock roses, many from the Mediterranean region, and some of them have this fragrant resin on the leaves, which is sweet and balsamic and used to scent perfumes, deodorants, soaps, and all that jazz. And I've gotta admit, when I came home from this trip, I ordered two <laughs> rock roses. The second resinous plant that absolutely fascinates me is the mastic tree. It produces a gum that you can eat. And I didn't know this plant uh, at the time when I was at the RCP, and I didn't make the connection until later when I ordered some mastic for a recipe. I got this one directly from Greece. And look, look, look at the, the mastic. It, it's so pretty. But there are so many recipes. Uh, from Iran, Greece, Turkey, that I wanna try, especially this Persian stretchy ice cream that uses mastic and this uh, orchid root powder called salep. Now we're going to check out the poison garden. You need to know the code to get in, but fortunately, I know the code. Okay, poisonous plants. What could we find? Probably belladonna, aconitum, foxgloves, which are digitalis. Oh man, this is beautiful. How charming is this unassuming poison garden in the middle of London? And sure enough, there are foxgloves, wolfsbane, and monk's hood, but also common honeysuckle, boxwood, and tobacco, our modern day killer plant. 
While we're on the subject of toxic plants, let's head over to the European and Middle Eastern beds to talk about Atropa belladonna, or deadly nightshade. Deadly nightshade is famously poisonous, but its strong chemicals can be used to our advantage. Early isolations of atropine meant doctors in the 1800s could dilate pupils for cataract surgery, relieve colic, and treat asthma. Even today, asthma sufferers use inhalers with synthetic derivatives of atropine because it relaxes the airway muscles. In this part of the garden, you can also find giant reed, which is responsible for lidocaine. You're probably familiar with lidocaine. It's the primary numbing agent used in dentistry. It's commonly prescribed as a skin cream, and it's used in many other ways. It's an anesthetic that prevents pain by blocking the signals at the nerve endings in the skin. It's gentle yet effective, and in many cases has replaced the need for cocaine as a local anesthetic. Next, we have the classical world bed. Think ancient Greece and Rome. These plants play a role in epic tales and the line between medicine and mythology gets kind of blurry. For example, Dittany of Crete. When Aeneas got shot with a deadly arrow, Mama Venus washed his wound with Dittany of Crete and the arrow fell out and he lived. You could spend a whole day in this little part of the garden unraveling the influence that the ancient Greeks and Romans still hold over us. I mean, just look at what we call these plants. Centauria comes from Chiron, the centaur. Smilax, the nymph who fell in love with Crocus. Hypericum comes from the Greek sun god Hyperion. I could go on and on. Let's travel forward a bit in time to the 1500s and imagine visiting the Royal College of Physicians in its infancy. What herbs would they have been talking about? Maybe ladies mantle or chamomile, maybe wormwood or rose or lavender, probably sweet woodruff, which was a very popular old world herb. Not used so much today, but this sweet smelling herb was historically used to heal wounds, flavor wine, and even cover up bad odors like the OG Febreze. We've covered a lot of Eurocentric medicinal plants so far, so let's head on over to Far East Asia. We could spend hours diving into traditional medical practices in the East, most famously traditional Chinese medicine, which to my limited understanding is about treating imbalances in the body, usually through body work and herbal remedies. This approach to health is still used by millions of people today, and I can't even imagine the number of plant species that are prescribed on a daily basis. Some herbs, however, have made it into mainstream medicine, like Japanese star anise. Because of this plant and its siblings, we have Tamiflu and other antivirals for influenza. Some other plants in this bed are Liriope, more peonies, hardy impatiens, pasta, dragon head bamboo, and may apples. Did you think may apples were strictly a North American species? Because uh, I did. <laughs> Turns out many places in Asia have potophyllum species. There's a resin in the roots called potophyllin, and today we still use that resin to make a topical treatment for genital warts as well as anti-cancer drugs. Lady slippers are another plant group that grow in both North America and Far East Asia. This one is endemic to Taiwan, and these are the native ones growing near my house. Now, let's move on down to the Southern Hemisphere, starting with Southern Africa. The landscapes of Southern Africa might look very different to temperate regions of Europe and North America, but there are relatives of plants that you might already know, like sage, geraniums, agapanthus, red hot poker, calla lilies, and Artemisia. See, you know your plants. One plant I didn't recognize, one that happens to be very fascinating, was the African stargrass. The medicinal values of this plant are just too long to list and are still being researched today actually, but it has immune enhancing properties and is often used for prostate problems. And this juicy little plant is orange bulbin. It's like the South African version of aloe vera. Represented here are more medicinal plants from the Southern Hemisphere. So we have plants from Australia, New Zealand, um, South America. Right, so Australia and New Zealand. Two plants you might be familiar with, at least if you're of the healthy hippie persuasion, are the tea tree plant, where we get tea tree oil from, and the monica plant, you know, monica honey. And from the island state of Tasmania, we have this flax lily, which very pretty, but also very poisonous. 
Finishing our trip around the southern hemisphere, we have a few plants from Central and South America. I imagine it's really hard keeping South American plants alive in London, yet they've done it with these Andean tubers called oca. I've tried to grow these before and they promptly died. Reminiscent of potatoes, these tubers are widely eaten in South America and all parts of the plant have been used in traditional medicine. Now, before we visit our last continent, we have to check out this giant, beautiful Hippocratic plane tree. Hippocrates is considered the father of medicine, right? And according to legend, he taught his students under a plane tree. And so medical colleges all over the world have planted cuttings and seedlings from this tree allegedly tied to Hippocrates. And after a quick Google search, I learned that I didn't have to go all the way to London to find one. I could have driven four hours from my house and found three of them at local colleges. So now you know, the Hippocratic plane tree. Let's end this tour of the RCP Garden of Medicinal Plants with a collection that hits close to home. The plants behind me here are medicinal plants of North America. It's so bizarre seeing your own flora from an exotic perspective. This is a Semina triloba, which is the pawpaw. Sanguinaria canadensis, which they make sanguinary from that plant. Oh, Hydrastis canadensis, which is golden seal. Um, what else do we recognize? Gaultheria procumbens, which uh, is oil of wintergreen. So this is spice bush. Love me some spice bush. This bed is a great representation of North American medicinals. There are a few more sections that I'm not gonna cover here and obviously many, many more plants to look at. So you'll just have to go to the RCP yourself and uh, check it out. The RCP Garden of Medicinal Plants is, in my opinion, such an underrated public garden. And I just have to thank Jane Knowles and the staff for being so welcoming and letting us explore. I still can't get over how many plants they managed to pack into such a small space. And the amount of information they provide is by far the most I've seen for a physic garden. And it doesn't even include the info you'd get if you booked a guided tour. So if you're ever in London, I highly, highly recommend taking a few hours to immerse yourself in this amazing garden of medicinal plants.